Welcome back for our final panel of the day on the role of CCUS technology in the energy transition, moderated by Dr. Jürgen Petersheim. If the panel and the moderator, please Let's have a warm welcome. Yes, good afternoon. Um, last panel of the day, always a bit tough but I promise it's gonna complement the others pretty well and uh, you will have some uh, new information, get some new insights on uh, a very relevant topic, I feel. Um, carbon capture utilization. So um, we'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Uh, let me just give you a brief update on, uh, oh, let's say a short introduction, really. Um, the energy transition itself, I think, it's in, there is no silver bullet. So it's sort of like a puzzle with different pieces you have to get together to get it right, to, to come to net zero. Um, and what I think, so the first piece I think is sufficiency, so consume less, then we have the efficiency part. So basically what we consume, we better produce and use as efficient as possible. Then we come to, let's say the Renewable energies, I mean, we heard a lot about geothermal today. Uh, there was mentioning of offshore wind occasionally. Um, you know all the other ones. Um, and then last but certainly not least, we have uh, the CCS part, basically carbon capture and utilization. The technology has been sort of tested in the energy on the power sector for quite some time. Um, it looks like in this particular sector, other options emerge be more beneficial, but for the hard to abate sectors, Think steel, think cement, think chemicals, uh, transport fuels, particularly uh, aviation fuels and shipping fuels. Uh, CCUS is going to play a major role. So, and I read this article in The Economist recently, and it states, uh, "Can carbon removal become a trillion-dollar business?" And that's exactly what I want to discuss with uh, my fellow panelists here today. Um, ideally, I'd like to give you. Uh, each a word quickly to introduce yourself, um, so that uh, before we jump into the topic, we get to know a bit you, uh, you, what your company, what you're doing, and Christiana, let's start with you, I guess. <laughs> your introduction, so uh, just a quick word about you. Uh, so my name is Christiana uh, Christiansdottir. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for Carbon Recycling International. We're a company offering a technology solution and have been in the carbon utilization space for over 15 years. Uh, so we know the space really well uh, before it became a trend and hot topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Anastasios Perimenis. I'm actually Greek. So if, if the Dutch person was feeling weird in this <laughs> panel, <laughs> imagine myself going on the other side of Europe. Um, I'm the Secretary General of uh, CO2 Value Europe, which is a uh, Brussels-based association, and it is representing the carbon capture and utilization uh, community in Europe. And we will discuss what this means. Hi, my name is Sultan Alec. I'm CEO at Landwärmel. We are a biomethane trader, so doing something completely different, providing renewable natural gas and renewable methane. Uh, but doing so, one part of our process is converting biogas into biomethane. We do this by carbon capture. So carbon capture has been around with us for now over 15 years and uh, now we are starting to utilize uh, the source of uh, CO2. In just our portfolio, it's over a million ton of CO2 we can provide for utilization or also for storage projects. Welcome everybody. All good? And I hope everybody is fine over there. My name is uh, Mark Rügeberg and I'm working in the Volkswagen Group, um, in the Group Innovation, and uh, we focus on CO2 economy, um, which means like the CO2 topic itself as a whole um, for the calculation of business cases um, in terms of um, value for the group in the supply chain and all the products and we've been focusing on this um, as a group uh, since 2015, but in the um, department I'm heading um, in 2019. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Christian Gilarsson. I'm from a company called Carfix. Uh, we um, turn CO2 into stone. 
So we've been doing that since 2012. Uh, my role there is um, I'm heading uh, commercial strategy and, and business development. So uh, in short, uh, this sparkling water here, we are pouring into the ground, like Mother Nature has done for millions of years, uh, where it stores and remains for millennia. Excellent. Well, thanks, thanks for that. And I feel we have a pretty good, let's say, a broad panel of sort of OEMs, technology providers, sort of users, uh, and then uh, Anastasius with the um, regulation part. Um, I'd like to arm you with a few facts before we start the discussion. Uh, so, recently the US uh, Department of Energy uh, stated that by 2050 we will need to sort of uh, CCS capacity within 400 million to 1.8 billion tons of CO2. Um, if you extrapolate this across the planet, we will be talking about something like 8 billion tons of CO2 annually by 2050. If you want to meet this target, um, we would have to invest within this decade 150 billion dollars. So a lot of money. Um, and for 150 billion dollars, I think, as an industry and technology, you have to provide some unique benefits. And I'd like to get your views on, and maybe let's start with the technology providers, but what do you think is a unique benefit of CCS that makes it a relevant complementation of the renewables? So in general, I think, um uh, the CCUS um, as, a, as an industry is in its infancy. So we are literally taking our first steps towards something that will be big. I think everyone is realizing uh, the seriousness of the issue, the problem we're facing. And the, the fact of the matter is that we don't have time. We have to act right now. So policy being the biggest obstacle, I use that word, very strong word, but it is uh, slow uh, in reacting, it can't do much better. Uh, in regards to the numbers that you mentioned before, it's estimated in 2050 that uh, you know, CCUS will need to, on an annual basis, to store and utilize between five and 8,000 million tons of CO2 per annum. Just to put it in perspective, last year, 40 million tons were stored globally. So there's a big shift from 40 up to 8,000 million. So uh, the seriousness of the issue is extreme. So again, we have to act right now. There are tools available within the uh, storage, within the capturing and within the utilization. It's a matter of, of, of uh, you know, just do it, make things happen. Mark, do you see it similarly? Yeah, from our perspective on it, um, we started uh, with a decarbonization, or as we call it, um, on the parts for avoidance, removal and compensation of CO2 emissions um, in 2015 because uh, we saw that there is ri a rising penalty situation, I would call it. Um, so you have to pay for each ton of CO2 emissions and the price is rising. So um, for a, a company, it is a business perspective um, that you want to take uh, care of uh, to see the, where are the prices developing to <laughs> and what are the measures you can do against it or how can you deal with such an uncertainty or such a risk. And there are different measures like, for example, CCUS um, that we investigate um, and see is there a potential um, that we can avoid paying penalties um, to the um, yeah yeah like the the state or or um, like the government um, can we use or utilize um, a certain technology in order to make business out of it or to make it run and how can we deal with it. And uh, as a group, it is always uh, for us with uh, more than 670,000 um, employees, a very challenging task because it's a lot of products, but also a very big footprint behind it. So it is um, a task we have to calculate, um, very, very um, feasible. And to make it work, uh, we cannot spend too much um, trials, I would say. Mm. So that's why we look into this uh, whole picture and evaluate in the first step before we make the choice, 
And again, I have to repeat like uh, other speakers, it is a matter of um, the regulation and um, to set the clear um, boundary conditions for um, every industry, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, regulation was mentioned twice. We'll come back to that later as a bit of a deep dive because I'm pretty sure you have some ideas on your wish list, let's say, what, what to improve. Sultan, what's, what's uh, the unique benefit of CCS for you? I think um, to really face climate change, climate ch the challenge we have there, um, we have to restore common uh, balance of the planet as it was 150 years ago. So it's not enough to cut emissions by 80% or 100%, but we have to start a phase decades or even centuries where we take CO2 out of the atmosphere. And in the end, it came from fossil places, so where we took the natural gas out of the coal and we put it down underneath the earth again. Besides that, there are going to be different applications. We're going to have usage cases, we're going to have e-fuse and so on, but this is going to be in in the range of million tons, 100 million tons of CO2, which we can utilize in industry and application. But most of it is going to be storage. And I think it's completely OK to start now, because we have to ramp up this industry and not to wait until we have finished the task of reducing emissions. And at the end, I think from an economic point of view, there's going to be like a, a point where reducing emissions gets so expensive. If we try to f uh, fly renewable today, if you try to produce renewable air fuels, uh, this is so expensive. We're talking about cost of over 1,000 tons of CO2 reduction. It's much more easier to uh, direct air capture and store it, do something with bioenergy where you produce energy at the same time and have CO2. So this has to be, so I think people are starting to see this big potential and it can start to grow because it doesn't matter where it happens. It doesn't matter where you take the CO2 out of the atmosphere, it doesn't matter where you store it, as long as it happens. So it gives a big chance for globalization also. It's something, I think, because we are here for, from the Iceland uh, perspective, there's a big chance also for uh, places on the earth where you have energy and perhaps also storage capacities, but you don't have the interconnection. Well, you can do this service to humanity and take CO2 out of the atmosphere and send the bill to US or Europe and live from that. Yeah. Thanks for that, uh, Christiana. As a technology uh, sort of expert or supplier to the market, what do you think is your specific uh, benefit uh, offering the net zero agenda? Yeah, so in terms of how CO2 utilization can complement uh, the reno renewable energy, and, and in essence, it's this massive, I mean, governments have set net zero goals which are going to be achieved. And this is requiring an unprecedented energy transition. And to be able to do that, there are a lot of changes which need to take place. And it includes the replacement of fossil-based sources. And these are carbon-based. And you have to get the carbon somewhere. And our technology solution offers that, and it's already been deployed, utilizing captured CO2 for the production of methanol. And methanol is a fast-growing market. You've already seen it a lot in the news. The marine sector has already taken it up. You already have ships under production, which are going into that field. The EU has already set in place regulations requiring mandates for synthetic aviation fuels, and these are expected to come from the utilization of carbon from direct emission sources, because that is the more energy efficient way to capture that carbon. And uh, maybe Anastasios, I mean, uh, you have a sort of a more of a regulatory policy lens. So what do you think? Uh, what's, why would regulation drive uh, CCS? Uh, what's the unique benefit? Um, so f first, a small note. Um, we, we sometimes uh, put the terms together as CCUS, mm -hmm. and it's often confusing uh, because the business models are different. The, some parts are common, like the capture part, but the the the, um, the overall idea of CCS is a little bit different than CCU. It's a little bit different than uh, CDR. So um, I think we should talk about the terms by distinguishing them because the, the environmental leap can be also different. CCS is a linear approach. CCU is a more uh, circular approach. So 
the the regulation i'm going to make the su surprise here and not say necessarily that uh, the regulatory framework is a barrier or or a, or an obstacle so far uh, we've heard it before um, it's it's a very important aspect but this couple of years there has been an unprecedented effort a regulatory effort on the on the at eu level with a with a green deal with a fit for 55 there is 20 at least instruments that have been revised or uh, new instruments coming into play so the regulatory effort is there and it is important because this will give the certainty the legal certainty to investors that are ready to invest in upscaling those technologies as uh, um, uh, Christiana said, there are uh, regulatory instruments on the downstream for aviation that says, for example, 35% of uh, uh, fuels in the aviation sector by 2050 need to come from synthetic aviation fuels, which is another word of saying CCU fuels, basically. Um, there are similar instruments for, uh, for the maritime sector, fuel EU maritime. There's a renewable energy directive that open up the route for those products, also in industry. Um, they use a fancy word there. It's called uh, Renewable Fuels of Non-Biological Origin, RFNBO. Um, and there is the ETS, Emission Trading Scheme, that has been revised also to uh, uh, complement uh, the, the CCU and the CCS. So there is the effort, the regulatory effort is there. I think um, even more important is that this these 20 plus instruments first of all they are consistent and that the one does not provide um, targets that another one might uh, make more difficult to achieve them because for example you cannot access one particular source of co2 or you cannot access the renewable electricity that we need so this is one important step that the regulatory framework is consistent uh, and that it allows uh, in this decade, the upscaling, the first of a kind mm -hmm. uh, projects, the second of a kind projects that will truly show the potential of uh, these technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, you rightly started separating into CCU and CCS. So I think uh, uh, from the application and sort of carbon abatement potential, uh, or let's say pathway, uh, maybe Mark, I guess you have a good overview of uh, the different CCUS technologies. So how would you see CCU and CCS develop? Is there one going faster than the other or what's your feeling? I, I would answer, uh, currently um, we see that um, the CCU uh, sector, um, yeah, there, there it might be a pathway. Um, we started with a Porsche project in down in Chile. Um, the e-fuels uh, production in a, of course, pilot plant, um, but it is the first step for commercialization. So um, I would say we take the chance on the um, CCU part because um, there are some, as Anastasia has already mentioned, there are some regulatory efforts already been made. And uh, we see that um, in the future, in the supply chain, there will be additional CCS need. Um, and this needs to be um, regulated and officially acknowledged in the e European Union mm -hmm. that you can apply those different technologies um, and work with it to, of course, um, drive down the re remaining footprint of the supply chain, for example. And what we did already with, the, for example, electrification in the um, passenger car vehicle is um, that we took a giant leap in terms of decarbonization, um, the, the major footprint of one specific part. But the remaining part is like in a different scope, like the scope one, two, three. So there is the supply chain we have to take care of also. And uh, so it all has to take um, means in all those different um, yeah, playing fields, I would say. Mm -hmm. I know it makes sense. And Christiana, you are on the on the CCU side, you are fairly active. So, I mean, you mentioned methanol. Um, do you think this is going to be the main application in the short term and uh, or SIF complementing? And is the CCU space or applications going to change over time? Do you see what we produce today in CCU? We will produce the same in terms of in 2040, 2050, same products? Do you mean the same amount or the no, same? No, not the not the amount. The volume is 
hopefully go, going going to go up. Okay. But in terms of end applications, so today, let's say methanol SAF, will that change in the future? Could we see other other materials being produced? Um, so SAF is something that is maybe not the shortest term goal. I mean, you have a, some few uh, regulatory or or not regulatory barriers, but also just approval barriers for the technologies in terms of it being mm. used as an aviation fuel. Yeah. So that's maybe a little bit longer term, but still probably shorter than we expect. Um, I mean, technology develops continuously, right? So you'll you'll have technology development over time. There were things that will be possible which we can't even imagine, uh, so hopefully. But there is uh, significant interest and in being a company that has been in this space for 15 years and I've been with the company for 10 years, I see a huge change. And just even in just the past two years, the dramatic demand for methanol and not only in the chemical space, which is a space that, you know, methanol is one of the most versatile chemicals used globally. It's used in all over you in your daily life, uh, in paint and glue and silicones and fleece. And you, you might have heard of it until it was discussed as a marine fuel. And But this is one of the most fast growing spaces. And the uh, Irena reports forecast that methanol by 2050 will have increased by 400%. Uh, and this is due to the energy transition and the growth in the green methanol and the low carbon methanol space. So yes, long term, probably there will be change that I can't even predict. Uh, but short term, I mean, the growth has been significant uh, just in the past 12, 24 months. Mm. It's also something we see, you know, that uh, methanol certainly is going to come Yes, it's used in every day, almost every part, day of, part of our life. Uh, Zoltan, on utilization, what, what do you think? Do you agree with Christiana on, on the applications? Or do you think there would be other uh, possible routes as well for CCU? I think we're going to, first of all, all the uh, fossil CO2 sources we have today. So really reflect on that. So we, we are currently really digging CO2 out of the earth. So there are natural sources for CO2, fossil CO2, and we put it into you know, water. So we have to replace every fossil CO2 sources, first of all, in the current applications, because there are applications for CO2, but the amounts are tiny. I mean, there's three million tons in the European Union. It's not the, the, the game changer here. Uh, the next one is something more like chemical industry, so methanol, but other applications, so everything which is where we produce plastic and stuff like this, which is mainly based on oil. Could be a big application, so then we're talking about several 10 million tons of uh, CO2. And then the final decision is, do we take CO2 as a carrier for hydrogen? So do we go the path of e-fuels or not? This is something, I think it's a technological question, it's an economic question, and the end, uh, politics have to decide. So, if we don't leave out the e fuels, uh, utilization will be always a, a small part of the whole carbon business. Sure, Christiana. I would like to correct that because uh, methanol today is a hundred million ton uh, globally. 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 Yeah, yeah, yep, meant, but meant, yeah. but even for Europe, I mean, most of our production is made elsewhere. That's why our carbon footprint is lower, and we can't forget that. We can't dismiss the fact that oh, we've lowered our carbon footprint, but we simply moved our production somewhere else, and that can't be forgotten, and that's part of some of the regulations and policies which are being put in place, and maybe you can add on that. But the chemical industry is a huge market already today, and you know populations will grow, and with that, there will be also growth or some growth of, of consumption as well. And all of this plays part. And there are even a lot of processes which are being developed even further today, like methanol to olefins and plastic processes which are being looked at in both home care products and cosmetics. So even your, you know, L'Oreal and Christian Dior and Yves Saint Laurent, they're mm. already looking at different paths for packaging. So even routes where methanol wasn't used before is being looked at today. And we know that because we're in the full value chain of the space as CRI. And maybe Anastasia uh, on, let's say, offshoring emissions. Uh, sort of any any comments on that? Sorry, on on sort of moving production elsewhere. I mean, that should not be the, uh, the end goal because it's not helping the climate really. So, what do you think, regulation? Yeah, uh, um, I mean, do? 
from a regulation point of view, there, there is a specific instrument that will come into place and that will uh, avoid this, uh, let's say, um, moving effect. Uh, it's, it's the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, it will apply to some uh, products that they, it's kind of a, of a, of a, 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 a tax, a border tax for importing in Europe um, um, products that are made outside Europe with less attention to environmental uh, uh, impacts. Uh, but th this is not only the, the issue, the, the, the point is that uh, we need to be able to keep in Europe the, 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 the clean tech technologies that we have uh, um, know-how of. Uh, instead, and, and that means that we will be able, we will need to uh, be able to valorize all uh, emission streams that are available now to produce precisely those products before going uh, and uh, seeking those emission sources uh, somewhere else and producing those products somewhere else. So uh, it is important to be able to uh, valorize through those technologies, like CRI's technologies, like carbon technology in areas in Europe where they are available. Uh, and th this is, this is uh, a, a crucial part, especially for the, the, the first of a kind, the newcomers, that they have this certainty that their emission sources um, can be valorized uh, into a marketable product that will replace uh, a conventional fossil product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, finding, let's say, these off-takers. I went to a cement facility recently. They put in the first carbon capture facility and turns it into formic acid uh, because they can sell it to a customer. And they actually get paid well for this and manage to get the uh, capex uh, to realize this project. Uh, Christian, I mean, you are in the mineralization space of, uh, of CO2. So storage, how do you see this market developing? What, what do you think is going to happen in the next, let's say, five years and then moving forward? Well, um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, significant uh, change from 40 million up to between five and 8,000 million per year, that kind of summarizes the potential of the market. Uh, for us, uh, we are now, we have been granted uh, uh, funding from the European Innovation Fund, uh, building uh, the Coda terminal in Iceland. That's going to be the world's largest mineral storage site. We will be importing CO2 from mainland Europe, from emitters, for, for example, here in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, large tankers um, in, in a liquid form, where it will be, um, you know, mineralized into the into the bedrock in Iceland. Uh, this is again a new industry in the making. So this project alone is estimated to be creating somewhere between 800 and, and 1,200 jobs. Uh, while being in the implemented. So, uh, but this is first of many. This is going to be 3 million per year over a period of 30 years. That's 90 million in total. That's still a, a, a tiny, 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 tiny portion. So that's point to point uh, terminal. We are looking at it from a, it will always be more economical if you can actually utilize uh, at the same site as the actual emitter is. So, for example, here in Germany, if the, the bedrocks are feasible, it will always be most economical to do it here. We are introducing a new technology, well, actually the oldest technology ever, because this is Mother Nature. So we are simply replicating what Mother Nature has done for millions of years. So I foresee that, and, and the statistics and the figures, for example, from the International Energy Agency support that. They estimate approximately 1,000 billion tons need to be avoided in the next 30 years. That's for the entire, you know, uh, energy transition. And the CCUS is only 12% of that. And storage is 90% of that. So it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And I cannot, you know, put more emphasis on it that we have to act now. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, uh, I mean, yes, there's 40 million tons today. So let's say, the CAGA or the growth rate is significant. Um, and it sounds a bit like, you know, the solar industry 20 years ago. So starting to grow. Um, what we've seen in the solar industry, I mean, we have seen spectacular cost reductions uh, uh, of solar generation, of wind generation. Uh, 
when you look at the literature for CCUS, uh, I think we start seeing similar trends. You know, a few years ago, we saw abatement costs for CCUS uh, of, let's say, $600 per ton. This is coming down, latest numbers, there's a broad range. Uh, you'll find everything from 50 to $230 uh, dollars per ton. So costs are falling. Um, how, what do you see technology costs? And maybe Mark, because uh, you have a broader overview. What do you see, when do you see CCUS and maybe start separating CCU and CCS into uh, being economic or being in the money? Uh, what, what time frame? Uh, my background is um, manufacturing technologies indeed, and uh, I can completely agree uh, to what you say because uh, so far as we see it, the basic technology is on a very high technology readiness level. Um, it is um, currently only pilot projects um, being deployed. Um, first, uh, bigger projects are already started or um, facilitated, um, will be up and running by the end of this decade. So um, we see um, first projects getting in a commercial um, sense or will work business-wise business um, um, by the end of uh, this decade when the first projects will be um, deployed um, in a, in a um, number where you can scale things so you don't have like manufacturing um, on um, like it's highly automated manufacturing technologies you can mm -hmm. apply for example you will um, see similar um, cost reduction as in the um, other industry sectors like uh, the production of, for example, PV um, costs. Um, yeah. So to, to our understanding, it will happen by the end of this decade. And um, for us, um, to, to I would add, I agree completely with um, um, Christian, is, is um, if you look at the market, CCU and CCS, um, we see that uh, there is already on this planet such a big number of investment uh, put into place for uh, infrastructure and to operate all that we are consuming daily. And uh, we are producing daily more uh, polymers, um, more fuels and so on. There's a um, growth uh, in the in the fuel consumption because mobility, which is a um, topic I heard in the morning, uh, the the limit on the on the highway. Um, I would say uh, let the market regulate um, the 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 pricing for the the technology because um, the market will will develop. It's like the lithium ion um, cell for battery. Um, it took some time, but at a certain time, it was very convenient and everybody um, saw there are major advantages, like in the mobility sector. You don't want to get penalties all the time. You, it would be, it's what you do with your children. You, you, incentive, uh, you give incentives to the children and they will learn much faster. And um, that's what uh, the US or for example, in comparison, does the European Union or the ETS it gives penalties? The US, um, for example, gives incentives. So um, the the money will uh, go the the way uh, where it's attractive, yeah. most attractive yeah. to the the companies, mm. and then you can get advantages from um, both parts. Like the decarbonization <coughs> doesn't have only disadvantages, it has some major advantages, uh, advantages. For example, not only lower footprint, but if we switch from coal-fired power plants to gas-fired power plants, for example, um, we had a cost reduction also. Um, of course, there are some outer um, yeah, circumstances we cannot influence. For example, the, the war in the European Union um, from Russia, it, it interfered, um, so we had to switch back to the coal-fired coal mm -hmm. power plant, for example. But again, um, we see um, a shift. First, um, the utilization of carbon dioxide 
but in its wake we cannot wait to build up the infrastructure for the storage part. Yeah. But I think I agree infrastructure is key to get this right uh, this year. So but coming back to the when is it going to be cost competitive so you say let's say late 20s early 30s so it sounds a bit like the hydrogen area so we, we hear similar time frames. Zoltan do you think this feel the same uh, around the early 30s? I, I think if you look at the sources of CO2 you're going to see a cost curve so there are potentials and we have today's sources at the biogas plants where, where we have the CO2 for free. The only issue is you have to liquefy it and bring it somewhere. So you have just you have a lot of logistics. So liquefying it, 20, 30, 40 euros a ton. Transportation depends where it goes. If we send it to Iceland, it's going to add some additional cost. So there are sources, uh, sources which are very cheap, and there are going to be sources which are huge potential like direct air capture which will have a much higher level of cost but I think we can start off with the industry by tapping these very cheap sources which is especially in biomass but also in new applications where we grab fossil CO2 directly for example if there is a steam reformer to produce okay. hydrogen that are good opportunities and I think we see all we see a lot of movement in, in the market because ETS at a level of 90, 100 euro, it's tapping, it's, you know, it's uh, reaching that level that a lot of uh, applications can run on that. So we can pay money to transport CO2 to Iceland, even more, and uh, this is the opportunity. So we reached already a level in the market where it works. Okay. But not for all applications, but so it's going to be the start. So you point. say a niche market compared to today? Yes. Okay. And growing bigger uh -huh. if you reach like 100, 200 euros. Uh -huh. Okay. And Christiana, Christian, uh, I mean, you know the numbers best as a, as a technology supplier, so what's, what's your feeling? Uh, are you between, yes, niche market today uh, and late uh, 20s? Maybe Christiana first and then Christian. So there are already uh, plenty of opportunities which can be taken advantage of today. It won't be all, but the main cost factor which drives the decision for sites is not the CO2 price. Uh, it is the energy price itself. So it's the energy transition, the need for additional energy. This is the main cost for at least for our technology. Uh, and even if you're producing it into hydrogen, the main cost driver is the production of hydrogen itself. And any, any of the solutions which are being spoken about for e-fuels use hydrogen. And that is the main cost driver. So whether you're talking about methanol, hydrogen, ammonia, Hydrogen is still, and therefore energy, is still the main cost driver. What makes it unique for some of the projects which we've already in, are in operation, like the plant that we have in China, which is 110,000 ton production capacity, which is already operational, and a second plant being operational with 100,000 ton capacity in, in a few months, is that the hydrogen being used is a waste hydrogen. It is a byproduct stream from an already industrial source and therefore it doesn't have the same cost factor so you can immediately and that methanol produced is a low carbon methanol and it goes directly competitively into the market already and there is already significant interest uh, from the market in tapping into that product as well mm -hmm. and these are kind of the immediate steps you know we mightn't be able to do every optimal solution or utopian solution immediately, but there are plenty of solutions which are ready to be deployed today and can already have significant impact. And, and the plant that we have in China is a good example of that because it's 110,000 capacity, it uses CO2 for the production and it replaces coal-based methanol. So it saves about three to 400,000 tons each year by replacing a coal-based methanol. So there is a lot that can be done immediately. Yeah. If I can kind of add from from the uh, from the storage part mm -hmm. of it, so uh, just to, as Mark said earlier, it's uh, you know sticks and carrots, mm -hmm. meaning in Europe you have the ETS and in the US you have the the carrot that everyone is chasing. Yes. There is a market for you know it's not yet a full commodity, but you have an ETS market and the price for the ton is approximately 100 euros. Uh, so that's uh, the incentive, or let's say the, the stick that uh, companies, uh, you know, will move ahead. Yeah. So that's a driving factor. But if we look at the value chain, uh, there, is, there, there are four components for us. Uh, there's the emitter, the capturing, the transport, and then the storage part. 
So we are, of course, in continuous dialogue with all these parties within the value chain, mm -hmm. again, creating a new industry. So all everything, everyone is doing it for the first time. So the learning curve is very, very steep. There is, for, from our perspective, you have to remember we've been doing this similar as, as, as Christina was saying, this is not something that we are coming out with now. We've been doing this on a commercial basis since 2012. The cost for us in the entire value chain at uh, on power site, uh, geothermal site in, in, in Hedlisede, is less than $25 per tonne. That is the capturing, mm -hmm. the transport and the storage and the OPEX. So that is a number that is already in the green by far. So using the, the, the parameter as a 100 euro, but then again, to complex it even more, you have the voluntary market, which is the bio, the backs, and DAC, direct air capture. And then you have the, the mandatory market, which is ETS. So you have two different uh, you know, drivers as well. But from our technology, it is already in the green zone, if you want to say. Okay, so I mean, I, I take away you know, certain applications in the green or in the money today. Um, broader, let's say, commercial competitiveness by 2030. Anastasia, as we mentioned regulation earlier, what do you think is needed from a regulatory point of view to get to this broader market uptake? What would be your wish list, basically? Consistency. So if, if you have a, uh, an instrument that uh, puts uh, quotas, for example, for aviation fuels, then have an upstream instrument also that allows you be able to cover those quotas mm -hmm. uh, and not limit electricity uh, availability, not limit CO2 availability, not limit the sources that you can use. So consistency is one. Uh, for me, the most important part in this decade will be upscaling. Um, and instruments like the, like the Innovation Fund, for example, one of the largest uh, innovation funds in the world even, um, with 10 years uh, of operation funded by the ETS uh, uh, allowances and putting a lot of uh, focus on clean technologies like renewable uh, energy production, energy storage, CCU, CCS. So these, these instruments need to um, bring an ecosystem of funding, both private and public funding, for those first comers that can uh, de-risk the investment and in conjunction with the regulatory framework that will be certain and will provide this legal certainty to investors, then we can see the upscaling taking place and most of the uh, large scale, industrial scale projects that have been announced on CCQ with uh, uh, capacities of around 200 kilotons per year, for example, they will be operational in the next four to five years. And uh, for those projects, they will be the, the drivers for all the second of a kind, third of a kind, and the wide replication that we will need to um, make the products that we will need out of non-fossil carbon. So mm -hmm. consistency in the framework and uh, uh, investment for upscaling. Okay, maybe with uh, thanks for that. Maybe with just two minutes left, um, coming back to this, uh, can it become a trillion-dollar business? So. If you, had, if you had a wish each, uh, what do you think, what would be the most important thing to get uh, CCUS uh, to this trillion dollar business? So, and maybe short. And, and, I yeah, think I just said my wish Yeah, yeah, so. you started. I was thinking about not asking actually. Yeah, yeah. So, Christiana, maybe you're next. Actually, I quite like your wish list. <laughs> That works well with the time here, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the work, on the head. I mean, it's important, and it's important for investment. You have to have consistency yeah. because that de-risks, right? Absolutely. Uh, and and you have to, and this plays also into um, evening out the balance of uh, ensuring that there is a shift in the status quo of the cost of fossil-based sources and kind of transmitting that exponential cost to society into the price of continuously using it. So actually making that shift to make sure that, you know, it is a preferred choice to use the alternative solutions, which uh, lower the uh, overall carbon footprint of the world. Hey, Zoltan, what would be your one wish? One wish, if on the long run, if we take the income we have from ETS and other emission taxing system, 
and pay for those who take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it on the ground. So if we have two markets, one for negative emission and one for emission reduction or whatever. By the way, you will have in the yeah. with the carbon removal certification mechanism uh, in, the, in the future, in the coming days. It's not here, it's not here. Maybe Mark, quickly, and Christian. So Very short, the acknowledgement of um, the carbon source um, to get utilized in the utilization and or storage part. Makes sense. Yeah, I will be very quick. Uh, <laughs> I will say uh, education, uh, educating people about uh, the importance of, of having things, you know, where we stand, because that will push them even further. So. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Uh, these 45 minutes went quickly. Um, yes, thank you.